And bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. So Aaron, I've asked you to put a, a, uh, two verses next to each other from this reading. And we're going to go through the reading, but I, I want to make the contrast first. The title of the message is, Who Do You Say That I Am? So I'll get to that towards the end. I do not believe that there is a more significant question that Jesus asks in all of Scripture. It's the one that will be asked of you and me. It is the one that's being asked by the Holy Spirit over us all the time. Who do you say that Jesus is? And how does he feel about that? What does he think about that? So put the two verses up, if you would, please. Ah. So, in response to Peter answering the question, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answers, you are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God. Jesus responds, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but but my Father in heaven. If we're scoring, ten. Right? I mean, he answered the question correctly. While others are saying that it might be Elijah, it might be this, it might be that, right? We're going to get to that in a second. But Peter, not being taught by a human being, but by taught by God himself, he does not say this from his own words, his own knowledge, but the, the Father gives him the words, like the Scripture promises, gives him, he's open to the Spirit's movement, and he responds, you are the Christ, you are the Son of God. To that, blessed are you, Simon. Son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And it's going to go on to say some more blessings, some more authorities and powers. It's going to change his name from Simon to Petros, Peter. And we'll get to that in a second. But then Jesus changed the subject from asking a question to stating some facts. And he starts stating that he is going to be arrested, that he's going to be handed over from the religious people to the Romans, that he is going to be beaten, crucified, die, rise again. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus responds, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Same guy, same conversation. What happened? <laughs> How can you be 100% right and 100% wrong in the same conversation? If I were honest, I would dig into my life and dig into your life, and we'd reveal that that happens every day to us, probably. One a minute, we're on fire, and the next thing trips us up, and before you know it, words are coming out of our mouths that we said we'd never say again. Thoughts are coming into our heads that we say, we, we are a fickle people, even Christians. The good I want to do, I do not do. The evil I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Oh, what a wretched man I am. This struggle, this, it's hard. But what I want to do is remove the mystery. I want to reveal what does happen in me and in you and what happened to Peter. John Carson once, many years ago, 
taught a Bible study at our other office where he said, what if we knew what the devil's game plan was, right? What if you knew? What if you were a Kansas City chief coach and you knew all of the Jets plays? You knew when a coach was holding up a sign or making a sign that you knew exactly what defense was going to happen. You knew exactly what audible was going to happen. You knew whether it was going to be a runoff tackle or whether it, it's a huge advantage, right? Teams have gotten in trouble for that kind of stuff. Cheating. We will never get in trouble for cheating on Satan. What if we can know his game plan? What if we can know exactly what happened to Peter in this reading? What if we can know it and know it, then say, oh my gosh, I see how it's happening in me. So let's go on. G I'm going to take, go back to the beginning of the reading. And he says in his first question, who do people say that I am? Who do people say, not I, the son of man is? Who do people say the Son of Man is. Well, in order to play around with the understanding of the Son of Man, you have to go to Daniel chapter 7. And in da Daniel chapter 7, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. Sound familiar? He approached the ancients of days, the Father, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Jesus, when describing himself, calls himself the Son of Man. When the Son of Man comes back, when the Son of Man does this, the Son of Man does this, he is telling the world that I am the Son of Man mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. I'm him. But what do the people say? Well, some people say that it's Elijah. Some people say that it's some of the other prop. Maybe it's John the Baptist who was beheaded, came back to life. Jesus, the people give a lot of different answers to that question. Even people who follow you. Some say you're a good teacher. Some say you're a prophet. Some say that this. Some say that that. But the Son of Man isn't just anybody. The Son of Man knows the ancients of days. The Son of Man has an eternal dominion. The Son of Man has all authority and power. The Son of Man sounds like the Son of God. He is not up for our opinion. He's not asking whether we understand him. He's stating you need to. It's the problem and the answer in the same person. So one of Pastor Tom's biggest fears in looking over years of ministry and looking over the church in America is I think the greatest temptation that we face is that we make Christianity into our own image. I don't like those verses, so I'm going to ignore those verses because my Jesus wouldn't do that. My God wouldn't do that. My God would do this, not that. And before you know it, we're molding God instead of letting God mold us. It's almost as if we're God's creator and we get to tell you who you are. Satan will always want you to define who Jesus is a few degrees off of who he really says he is. Because then he robs you and I of the power that we would have knowing him truly. We compromise. We try to live a foot in each kingdom. Who's it going to hurt? Who's it going to affect? I mean, I haven't died yet. Like, that's a great measurement. You see, a frog eventually dies in a pan of water. All you got to do is turn the heat up slow. 
Satan's in for the long game. He wants you to think about Jesus differently than what Jesus says he is. He wants you to be in control of your faith rather than him be in control of your faith. He wants you to master him, God, rather than God mastering you. Hence, you're always going to be short of his forgiveness, you're always going to be short of his grace, and your Christian life is going to be miserable. It's exactly what Satan wants. He's a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't know the truth because the truth is not in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. He's a liar and the father of lies. So he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Am I beginning to show you what his game plan is? He's going to lie. Jesus is pointing it out when he says, Who do the people say the Son of Man is? Not one of them said, You! You see it? Not one of the answers was you. How can Jesus be preaching and casting out demons and healing people and doing all this stuff and they don't get it? Because we want to get it the way we get it. We want it to be in our image. What do you think Judaism did? Created Judaism in their own image. God finally said, I don't even know who you are. Finally, he makes the question more precise. He says, forget the people. What about you? There you go. Stop caring about what your husband thinks about Jesus, what your friend thinks about Jesus, what your son... What about you? If Jesus were to ask you right now, who do you say that I am? He does not care about your opinion. He wants to know whether you know who he is. Peter Moved by the Holy Spirit says you are the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one, all the Old Testament prophecies pointed to, and you are the very Son of God. You're the Son of Man. You're the Daniel 7 guy. (laughs) You did not say that on your own words. You didn't add up 2 plus 2 and figure that out. But Peter... You're now not Simon anymore, but you're Peter, because upon this rock, I'm going to build the whole church. That confession right there. If someone doesn't know me as the Messiah, if someone doesn't know me as the Son of God, if someone doesn't know me as the Savior of the world, if someone doesn't know me for who I am, they're lost and condemned. But Simon, the very Spirit of God, that moved you to spiritually understand the truth of my word and so boldly proclaim it, I'm going to build my church on that confession. Verse 18. You're no longer Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter, rock. And on this rock, not on Peter, on his confession... I'm going to build my church, and what? What? The gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not overcome it. No wonder Satan doesn't want you to live in the truth of God's word. Because as soon as you do, or I do, we submit to God, resist the devil, and he has to flee from us. The only way that he stays in the game is we start buying lies. Our ears start getting tickled with things. We don't like what we're hearing in the Word. And so we say, I don't like that part. I'm going to tear that page out. I'm I'm, going to forget that verse. The Word is supposed to chisel us and mold us into who God created us to be, not us decide what God wants us to be. Is this just a one-time thing? Or is this a blessing that every single one of us can have if we have a proper understanding of who Jesus is and hence who we are? Hold on to that. Does that mean that you and I might be able to live a life where the gates of hell can't even stand against us? 
that when we move, when we pray, God moves heaven and earth, when we move, we change the atmosphere of a room, we step into something, and all of a sudden things change, just like they did with Jesus? Bible seems to say yes. So why aren't we? Why are we robbed of that authority? Why are we robbed of that power? Why are we running to the ocean with a Dixie cup? When he wants to drench us with the ocean of his grace, he wants to give us power and authority to live as sons and daughters of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's because we listen to the lies of the enemy and we begin to re-describe Jesus and we rip him of his power and we rip him of his authority and we rip him of all the things that he wants to do in us. Are you with me? So, so, so I just want you to sit here and say, this is what he wants. He wants all of us to be Petroses. He wants us to stand on this confession. I'm going to build my church on this confession. Peter, you are right. And every single human being that says the same thing, believes the same thing, walks the same thing, is going to be living in the authority of my kingdom. They are going to move, and the gates of hell can't even stand against them. They Actually, the gates of hell, the demonic forces will have to flee from them. And then he predicts his death. But not just his death. He accurately, for the second time now, predicts it exactly the way it's going to be. The religious leaders are going to get me. And eventually they're going to hand me over to the Romans. And the Romans, well, they're going to crucify me and I'm going to die. And then I'm going to rise again from the dead. Now, something might have just triggered with that last phrase, but Peter was stuck on the first part of it. Didn't even hear the last section. That's part of our problem. We don't want to listen to the whole word of God. We want to listen to the parts we like. Somehow thinking that we're smarter than God is. That we know better. So that God, it doesn't matter if I just skip that part. I'll be okay. Yeah. Tell me how that's working in your relationships. Tell me how that's working. Obviously, obviously, Peter didn't like Jesus' statement, right? I mean, just sometimes we don't like what God's telling us. Sometimes we just don't like it. Even, it, like, like, we just can't even wrap my mind around why would that be good, right? How many verses in Scripture tell us that we should rejoice when we're suffering? Like, who makes sense out of that? You only know once you start doing it. And then you go, oh, now I know what it means. Right? Because it doesn't make sense on the front side. How can good come from suffering? What, 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 what benefit might there be? So I get, I get the issue. And I think we all get the issue. I want you to see what, G, what, what, what Peter does. He isolates himself and pulls Jesus away from the other disciples. Almost like he needs to school Jesus. Now, let's go back to Peter's confession. You are the son of God. Do we sometimes forget who's behind that frail Jesus, that loving, compassionate Jesus? Do we sometimes forget that he speaks and the earth melts? Do we sometimes forget that he's the one that divided water and swallowed up the Egyptians? Do we forget who this God is? Do we forget the fury? Jeremiah has some stunning passages about how devastating it is when we forget to have awe of God. That he's God and we're not. What in the world's going on in Peter's heart that he thinks he can pull Jesus aside and rebuke him? But how many of us don't do it every single day silently by just defying what he says? I'm not going to do it. I know what it says. I know what he wants. No. This is the way I want to live my life. I'm in control of my own life. Are you really? Will you say the same thing when you lose your job and lose your relationships? No, then you'll be screaming at God, why didn't you help me? It wouldn't have happened in the first place if you had your life right with me. 
I didn't move, you moved. That's always the case with God. Jesus didn't change. He is still the Messiah, the Son of God. Something happened in Peter where he decided he, he had some kind of authority and he moves back into the kingdom of this world and says, no, that's not the Jesus I want. I want you to be king. I want you to kick out these Romans. I want you to sit on a new throne inside of Jerusalem. This is what I want. I want you to give me another car. I want you to give me financial uh, uh, success. I want you to give me this. I want you to give me that. That's what I want, God. I expect these things from you. And we all of a sudden, we make God like the puppet on our strings. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus is aware exactly what's happening and he knows exactly what's going on inside of Peter. The one who just proclaimed that the church will be built on his profession is now sitting in the wrong kingdom saying, you're not the Jesus I want you to be. Get behind me, Satan. Peter's listening to the lies. He's listening to the lies. Creates insecurities, creates doubts and fears. Blah! He vomits on Jesus. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. I see the force and the power. Peter, just like the Father gave you the right words to say, the enemy will always give you the wrong words to say, Please, start having self-control. Know who's speaking. Know who you're listening to. Have the wisdom to discern the words. My words are true. All other words are false. Get behind me, Satan. You're no longer. You're no longer speaking words where I'm going to build my house, but you're a stumbling block to me. You're actually in the way of my kingdom. You've actually joined the demonic forces. You've actually joined the wrong side, Peter. In a moment, in a moment, you joined the wrong side just because you wouldn't surrender to my authority and you had to have yours. Do you see it? Pastor Tom, if I don't do this drastic thing, my relationship is never going to be the same. If you do not do it the way Jesus wants you to, you're exactly right. I have to do this, Pastor, for my own happiness. There's words that want to come right now that I have to control. And sacrifice what for that moment of happiness? Satan doesn't offer anything except death and destruction. He'll shine it up and make it look like joy. He'll shine it up and make it look like fulfillment. He'll shine it up, but it's a lie. As soon as you reach for it, it turns to dust and you're empty. Peter, I need you to stay Petros. Quit being Simon. I need you to be Petros. I need you to control yourself. Stop being that wave of the wind back and forth. Stop being that reed on the side of the water. Stop. I need you to be Petros. You do not have the mind of God. You have the mind of men. The very opposite of what was said about his confession, that it came from God the Father himself. I just want you to realize, one single move on Peter's part to turn back to the kingdom of this world, wiped away his entire confession. Jesus is saying, that stuff's going to happen in you all the time, and you've got to learn how to catch it. You need to learn how to stop it. You need to learn how on your own to repent of it. You need to be realizing the difference between your old nature and your new nature, the lies of the kingdom of this world and, and the truths of God's word. And I need you to start discerning those differences so that you can catch yourself and stay rock. Well, good news. Good news. 
this Petros guy, this Peter guy, Holy Spirit's going to fall on him in Acts chapter 2. And he's going to go out speaking in foreign languages with his disciples and they're going to convert 3,000 people in one day. He and James, John, they're going to rise up as leaders of the church. They're going to get arrested and they don't care. They're going to get threatened their lives. They don't care. They don't care. Peter's eventually going to get crucified and tell his executioners that he wants to be crucified upside down because he is not dying the same way Jesus did. He's unworthy. 11 out of the 12 disciples die martyrs because they just don't care. The kingdom of this world means nothing to them. The apostle Paul saw he was taken up to the third heavens. He saw, Stephen saw heaven. That eternal realm is a reality. It's the only one that's eternal. The one you're living in right now is not eternal. This one's ending. Could end today, could end tomorrow, could end 100 years from now. Do not know. But every single day, you and I better be ready. How do you be ready? Petros. Find Petros every day. Find the rock. Stand on it. Make sure that when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? Your answer is, you are the Christ. You are my Christ. You are my Savior. You are the Son of God. You you tell me I can call you friend. You've repaired my late relationship with the Father. I'm trying to spend my whole life following you and listening to you. I'm surrendering. I'm done molding you. I want you to mold me. Thank you for putting up with me in this fight. But I'm going to keep fighting, Jesus. I don't want to not know who you are. I'll repent any time I miss it. I'm going to praise God every time I'm successful because it's when I get to see the Holy Spirit working inside me, making me different today than I was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Every one of us older Christians, you know how we we, we raise our kids and tell them that, uh, you know, I'm telling you these things because I don't want you to make the same mistakes I did? While you're doing that about everyday life, how about do it spiritually? How many of you are vulnerable with your children, telling them about your sinful nature, how you live life, how you try to adjust how you think at work? Because they need to know how to adjust at school. We just seem to like bring them to church and expect by osmosis they're going to get it. The disciples got it by being around Jesus. Younger Christians and, and, and younger people need to be around us and kind of say, man, I'd like, that sounds like victorious. I want more of that. Well, okay, come follow me. Let's talk about it. All right. I could keep going, so I'm going to stop. Are you all good? You all good? Whew. Who do you say that I am? This week, that's the question. Not just one moment. I'm praying that all week long, God's going to pop it up when you're in your truck, listen to some music, when you're in the middle of an argument with your, your, your spouse or a friend or somebody, when you're in the middle of making a decision, I'm going to say, who do you say that I am? I want, I want, it, I want the Holy Spirit to pop that question in because it'll change how you respond. And now, boy, does, Satan's got to hide. He's got to hide because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. All right, amen.